for champions of new writing, this part of the festival is a particular thrill, as the second new play of Festival uh, 2012 now takes the Minerva stage. Michael Wynn's Canvas had its world premiere on Friday the 18th last week, and it opens to press this Thursday. Uh, my name is Rupert Robotham. I'm Director of Learning and Participation here at Chichester, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome uh, playwright Michael Wynn and... Uh, and yes. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, a Chichester Festival Associate Director, Angus Jackson, uh, to interview. <laughs> uh, Michael Wynne came rapidly to attention in 1994 with his Royal Court debut, The Knocky, and he's won a string of nominations and awards for his plays, including uh, uh, the, the Knocky won the Maya Whitworth Prize for Best New Play in 1995, Time Out Theatre Awards for Best uh, West Off West End Show was Sell Out. What's On Stage Award, Best Comedy Nomination. The Olivier Award for the Best Comedy in 2010 for The Priory. And the BAFTA for the Best British Film Evening Standard Award, uh, Best Screenplay for My Summer of Love. That's, a, that's a all right, isn't it? It's all right. <laughs> Very good. Um, uh, and Angus Jackson has been a kind of... Uh, intrinsic part of Jonathan and Ann Allen's tenure here and, and, and really vital to it. He's directed more plays than any other director in the Minerva um, here since Jonathan and Allen. He's been the associate director since he arrived in uh, 2006, uh, directing Carousel, The Father, Waltz of the Toreadors, Funny Girl, Wallenstein, Bingo, The Browning Version and Canvas. Angus's five-star production of Terence Rattigan's The Browning Version is to be found with uh, Jeremy Herring's production at uh, at the Harold Pinter Theatre uh, um, and uh, it regularly directs, directs at the National Theatre and directed the much-loved children's touring theatre production of Good Night, Mr Tom. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Michael Wynn and Angus Jackson. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, Michael, what gave you the idea for the play of Canvas? Um... Right. Um, I, I think it was... Um, I went on... Well, um, I don't know... I don't think anyone's seen the play, but the, the play is set on a... Oh, right, OK. Um, it's set on a, on a campsite, um, but a, 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 a campsite of um, these sort of new things, which are... which some people call glamping, where you go to a campsite and there's tents already set up and they have beds and kitchens and stoves and toilets and... Um, sort of luxury camping and I went away for a weekend in North Wales with my family to one of these places and it was three tents in a field and um, and we were there for a weekend and just while I was there I just thought god this would sort of make a great play this world where you're um, you're thrown up against these other people and I really sort of um, I like looking at public and private worlds and this is so public and private together, partly because you can hear everything. And, and also when you leave, you know, you're, you're spotted. And I remember times when me and my sister were like, oh, God, they're going past quick hide. Um, and um, so it sort of stayed with me, the idea. And then um, Angus asked me whether I wanted to write a play for Chichester. And I sort of went away and thought about some other things and then just kept on coming back to this and, and then went away and wrote it. And, and here we are. And also there was a bit of a, there's been a bit of a resurgence in camping in the last few years um, with the whole sort of staycation thing of people staying at home and not going abroad and people having less money. And um, so I thought it was sort of, it was quite good to tap into some of that as well. And uh, Angus, um, this is definitely a Minerva piece, isn't it? Um, uh, and I wondered, was there any choice about that or, or, or why is it a Minerva piece? Uh, yeah, I think it is. Um, well, when, when I approached Michael to write a play, we could, you could have written a play for the main house or the Minerva, mm. but I think uh, when, when Michael came back with this idea, I think part of the, 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 well, the enjoyment of it is what we're experiencing at the moment. I've got midges flying around my head. <laughs> uh, the, it, the, all of the textures of everything. It's, it's not a play of big rhetorical speeches. Um, uh, so I, I think in that sense, because it's about the interaction between people on a domestic level. I mean, there are big ideas in the play. You've seen, you've seen the play, but a lot of you haven't seen the play. But they're buried in amongst uh, you, just people, normal people with families and kids, you know, um, relating to each other. So I think in that respect, it sits well in the Minerva. 
I think most players you could do either in the Minerva or in the main house, I mean, to, to a great extent. But um, I think what's nice about this is you're right on top of the world. And, you know, the idea that people at the end are touching the grass to check that it's real, it is entirely real, I assure you, um, as is the mud. And it, 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 it's something very satisfying about that. But th th there's a kind of irony, isn't there, between being out in the great o outdoors and yet also being worried about who's hearing you next door. And that suits this space, doesn't it? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's interesting, isn't it? So the, the, the idea of going somewhere where you're contained, mm. even though you've gone to get away from everything, yeah. we're right, you're right on top of people. Yeah, I think that does work very well. And, and, and most of the characters in the play are, are sort of urban city folk and uh, they want to tap into you know, being free in the countryside and fresh air, but, they've, but also they want some of the luxury. So it's sort of, and there's one um, family who, you know, they've taken everything with them. They've taken a generator and a microwave and, <laughs> you know, just because they can't really leave all that stuff behind. But being so strongly associated um, with the Royal Court and, and, and yet also being invited to present a play here at Chichester, what was the big concern for you about doing the, the difference between them? I don't, I, I don't know. I think um, even though I've written quite a few plays on at the Royal Court, I, I think I, um, they're still quite populist plays. They're not sort of weird, um, sort of really violent, strange plays. I, I want people to enjoy them, but I still want to say something. Um, so they're often comedies. Um, so it didn't feel a million miles away, but I, I was aware that, um, uh, you know, I was writing for Chichester, so I did sort of take that into account. And um, so I thought I'd look at the middle classes a bit more. And, um, and <laughs> I don't know why I thought that. <laughs> and, um, and also maybe at times I gave my, myself permission to have a bit more fun with the comedy at times. Um, but I don't think I think this play could sort of work in the Royal Court. But I'm glad that it's here in a way, and um, it feels it feels like it's really at home here. Well, at the moment, it does. Yeah, I mean, there's a brilliant production uh, note in the program uh, by Matthew de Abitua, um, and uh, it takes the re reader on a canter through loads of themes. Um, I, I just wondered which particular themes kind of struck you as important when you were writing to get across? Um, I don't know. That, I mean, that, that piece he writes is, is brilliant, and um, I wish I'd sort of put more of that in the play. <laughs> um, but it is, it is all. Yeah, right? I think so. Um, there's sort of... Uh, what came through the play, which I w wasn't quite sure was going to be in there, was just the sort of political um, idea behind it about the economy. Um, which I think when you start watching the play, you think it's a sort of, sort of a bit of a frothy comedy. Um, but it's the, the, the central couple, um, all I don't really want to ruin it for people, really. Have, um, I've got quite a modern dilemma, which is related to what's going on in the economy at the moment. And sort of the other couples sort of rub that, rub that up. And um, so, so that sort of came up. And then just... Um, class. I, I feel like I'm always interested in class, even though I'm not really aware of it when I'm right now. Um, and the, the sort of the three couples are slightly different classes, and they're all sort of thrown together. Yes, brilliant. Um, and how much of that did you consciously want to put in the minds of uh, your cast, Angus? That's interesting. I mean, in, in the casting, it's it's a lot in the casting. You know, we did a workshop of the play and then and a reading of the play with various different actors. And we reached the point where we were casting much more to, for people to be of a, of a particular class than we'd perhaps anticipated when we read the play. Yeah. So you then don't need to put it in their minds because they sort of bring it all in with them, which is a good rule of thumb for making theatre, I think. If, if, you can, if you can gather some people who bring a lot with them into the room, yeah. then you're, you've already got a bit of a volcano that you can then sort of uh, uh, steer, that you can control or, or not control, in the case of our cast, who are a pack of wild animals. <laughs> but, uh, so, so, and then, and then uh, it, it's, 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 it's interesting doing a play like this, because you sort of, on some level, you could call it, or you, or you, you know, I don't know, you, people talk about state of the nation plays, and there's something about, about it having that, the, the scale of that ideas, and 
if you if you if you watch it, you'll think, oh no, it's just a play about camping. But it's all just sort of sitting under there. So you talk about it and you you expose it, and you 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 have people experts on the financial crisis and how it's proceeding and what people I mean this is a play set right here right now when they walk in through the door they're they're right now they it's they could have gone on the camping holiday today um which is different to lots of other plays certainly different to the Browning version which is the last play I did in here um so you get all of those things so you know exactly what's going on for these people and and then of course you spend a lot of, then you, you you try not they can't walk on stage and present that they can't walk on stage and say, I am a character who earns this much money and my children are this and my parents are this. They have to come on and be trying to hold their, both of their children while they're doing the tent flap. So that's what you do. You, you get it all out and then you put it all away again. Um, this is a question for both of you, really. Um, some of the I was talking to one of the company members about the texture of the language and he said it, he found the language really quite heightened. And that surprised me because I, it comes across with, with a very contemporary ear. And I wondered why he felt that it was heightened and I'm, how I'm much. Surprised. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, it's not heightened in a kind of Shakespearean mm. poetic sense, but heightened in a sense of every word has multiple meanings and multiple kind of layers to it. I just wanted you to well, talk a bit about that. Well, I think, yeah, I think that's interesting. I, 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 was that Oliver? Might be. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, Oliver Millman, uh, he, because I, it's very interesting, right? They found it ferociously difficult to learn. Now, if you try and learn a Shakespeare monologue, uh, uh, it's very easy, right? Because it's got a rhythm to it and it's, it, the lines are all the same length or whatever, you, you know. Um, and this stuff is really hard. And again, when you see it, you'll think, oh, well, it's just people talking normally. It's lots of lines like, yeah, yeah. And they just find it really difficult. But of course, we're sitting there going, no, you've got to say the exact word, even if the word is OK or um, or it's, oh, it's never um, actually, as a matter of fact. If they ever say um, then Michael didn't write that. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a line, right? OK, so I'll give you an example. There's a line that we've been chivying at today because it, it's a, in a scene with loads of people on stage towards the end. It's starting, they've gone outside for cigars and one of the men comes in and goes, it's starting to spit. And one of the actors said to me, how, how am I supposed to... I completely understand that that line is there because the relationships between the people on stage are starting to get antagonised to the point where it's like something simmering on the boil and it's starting to throw off poisonous, you know, boiling hot. And I said, no, you just, you just have to play that it's starting to rain. <laughs> and you could see him going, I don't understand. <laughs> and it wasn't actually the bloke with the line, who's Dean, who says the line, and Dean just plays the line. It's starting to spit. And I, I'm, I'm fond of saying in rehearsals that you can, uh, you can do so much, and then thereafter it's literary criticism. Yeah. So you can't, an actor can't play that that line is indicative of the fact that the relationships are simmering to the point where there's going to be an explosion. He can only play, it's starting to spit. But on some level, I hope, we hope, it goes in, every line is, is, has, has the nuances and meanings and within the context of it being, I would say, utterly naturalistic. I don't think there's a single line in there which you'd pick out and say, you know, that's, that's been crafted. Yeah. But yet, and yet they all have, arguably. Or yeah. did you just write them? I don't know, but that was a great answer. I've got nothing to say. <laughs> Michael, um, Alex Sears, the professor from Rose Bruford, uh, wants to claim your writing for a movement he calls In Your Face Theatre. Were you aware of that? Um, I thought I'd managed to avoid that. Um, um, right. Okay. No, well, more... But, I mean, that, that was sort of a title given to um, a load of writers who sort of appeared around the time I did at the Royal Court. Um, in the in the mid '90s, um, you know, my first play was on after after Sarah Kane's um, first play, Blasted, which um, became very famous and was very in your face. And um, and I, I thought I wasn't sort of so much a part of that because I, I wrote gags a bit. But um, yeah, I, I I could sort of take that on in yeah. a way. But uh, you, you can see where that that. Observation. I mean, yeah. I mean, I think I think there's all, there's always. I mean, that sort of movement was about sort of big dramatic and surprising things happening, and and the drama being 
very present and I think there's often moments of that in my plays and they often hopefully move towards some sort of dramatic surprise in climax so there's and there's often a darkness in there so I'm not going to dispute it too much no. I think it, it kind of where what I understand that to mean is that the audience will either want to get up on stage and say stop mm. or they'll want to come back again and say yes this is saying exactly mm. what I wanted to say it's it's an unignorable theatre which is a deep compliment I'm, I'm sure yeah um, and, and also it uh, does have certain themes like violence does break out characters do humiliate each other um, taboos are broken so you're kind of fitting in in that yeah. um, is there anything else you <laughs> I don't know I don't know how many taboos were breaking but uh I don't know. Yeah. No, it's that thing of comedy that you've got to, you know, give people problems and, and uh, or they've got to, I don't know. I mean, Jonathan Lynn, who directed and wrote Yes, Prime Minister, has written a book on comedy. I've just maybe he's read it. It's absolutely fascinating. And he says you've got to contravene the laws of society in order to put people in the struggle, which then starts to generate comedy because we're watching people struggle to deal with, for example, committing adultery or attempting to commit yeah. adultery or whatever. Um, so I think that's. That's an idea as well. I, I mean, I know a lot of those writers, like Mark Ravenhill or Sarah Kane, is uh, no, no longer with us. Would, um, yeah, I don't know that I'd group you all together, yeah. but then I don't know. Don't know. <laughs> okay. It's a good question. Very I don't good. know if it's an, an easy answer. No. Um, Canvas as a new play is obviously set in a world of, of the world that we're in today, you were just saying. Um, to what extent are these characters, um, uh, they, they're pitch. Yeah. To what extent are you pitching practical choices and personal politics against each other to avoid ideological uh, clashes? It seems to me that... Do you want me to repeat the question or think of another way of saying it? Because I lost myself in that, I'm sorry. Well, you can answer this one. <laughs> what do you mean? Well, I, 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 it's, it strikes me that it's a, a lot of the characters are... Um, they're, they're, they are they hold politics which is quite similar to their own personal position and like their jobs mm. or that sort of so you're not really pitching somebody with an ideologically held viewpoint you're pitching people with a kind of functionally personally political held viewpoint against each other right. is that because you wanted to kind of avoid an ideological discussion or is that because you wanted to kind of get people and their representative ideologies battling against each other so take it away from being personal or did you want to make it more personal well I don't know I think it's all it all comes down to being pretty personal at the, at the end of the day and, and the, the the characters um, politics um, all being wrapped up in what they do um, and and that gosh, gosh, it's quite a difficult question um but um i'm gonna mark you on your own. <laughs> really god um but i do think it's i think it's you know i, I studied politics at, at college and um and i thought i would probably go into working in politics somewhere but i wrote my first play in my final year of college as a distraction and um and when i you know my ideas are, are often a, a real before I start a play, it's like, well, what am I trying to say and who are these people? And it's once I've sort of sorted that out that I feel like I've got also where it's going to be said, but then I feel like I've got a play or somewhere to go. Um, so it always needs to have a bit of both. I don't know whether I'm answering the question. You are, yes. It's interesting that you, you, you studied politics. I'm wondering a kind of... So, so are you, when you're thinking of the play, do you bring those political tensions immediately into a clash because it's obviously all in there I think so but all you know hopefully towards the end of the play but it, it's something I'm very aware of um, and um, and that I'm sort of thinking of all the way through um, and I think one of the things I, I learned through writing at the Royal Court is to um, make things less overtly political uh, you know, some of my earlier plays would be a bit more tub thumping and sort of big speeches, and and um, sort of learnt that actually you can it has a bit more power if it's through people's actions and through their personal choices rather than I hate Maggie Thatcher sort of thing. You know, so um, and just make it a bit more muddy because I think, especially politics now, is much more complicated and and. Uh, 
you know, who we believe in and what we believe is, it can really change. So I sort of want to tap into that, really. And I always think there's no goodies or baddies in the plays. You know, I think sometimes you could think, especially in this play, there could be a, a clear baddie in a way or a couple of clear baddies, but I wouldn't want you to... I'd want you to sort of, you know, agree with one person and then, then agree with another and sort of get a bit... You know, your loyalties change and get caught up in what the characters are doing. Um, uh, before we open it up to, to questions from the floor, which we'd love, love you to be asking, um, is there anything you, that you would like to whisper to a friend before they go and see this piece that you just say, watch out for that or take note of that or...? Oh, I don't know. Um, I don't know if you've got an opinion. <laughs> No, I mean, I think, you've, but I, uh, I think you precisely don't with plays, don't you? I mean, I had a bit of a struggle with Edward Bond. He's not here, is he? Um, <laughs> on Bingo, and he wanted to write a programme note explaining to, explaining to the audience what the play meant. And I, I called you up and said, you know, and, and, and Ed, Edward's absolutely fantastic, but he, his, his politics are very, very close to the surface. And I was, so I was in a conversation. I didn't resolve it because it wasn't mercifully, it wasn't my decision to make. Um, and I called you up and, and uh, for support, really. And Michael said, well, no, you know, plays should speak for themselves and that they're not making... And I would say this is true of, of Edward Bond's work as well. The plays are not making points. And so I would be reluctant. I, yeah. I, I'm of the Katie Mitchell school, where for Katie's first show at the RSC, she wouldn't sell the programme to the audience till after the show because she didn't want anybody to read it beforehand or during. And I, I sort of believe it should be absolutely clean. You should just walk in through the door. Not if it's a play about, I don't know, Copenhagen's about nuclear physics or whatever, it may very well be that if I directed that, I'd be saying so. Werner Heisenberg was this person, Niels Bohr was this person. But I think if it's people walking through the door carrying their kids, precisely nothing at all. And I, and I really like, uh, I had a friend to come on the second preview and I said to her, you know, what do you know about it? And she was like, nothing. I was like, oh, well, that's great. And I'd just say to people, just enjoy it, you know, just to go in with the spirit of, 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 of enjoying it and going along with it. Cause, and I think actually being here in Chichester, the, the audiences do seem very warm and um, encouraging and, and knowledgeable of theatre. Sometimes in London, it's a bit like, oh, come on then, what have you got for us? And people go in sort of w wanting to hate it and, you know, or have made lots of judgments already. Oh, this is gonna be crap. And uh, <laughs> there seems to be a bit more warmth here and, that, and, that, and that's great. There's a strange science which much talks about, about how you let people know that it's OK to laugh. You know, that's experience, experience where you go to the theatre and you're thinking, all right, I'm at the theatre. <laughs> theatre is a very important art form. And you don't, at what point, you know it's OK to laugh. Mm -hmm. And we did. So, my, so perhaps a better answer to your question is we hit a point a few days ago when in consultation with Lucy Montgomery, who plays Justine, who's the first woman you see carrying her, ba her, her daughter, we put something in, which is the moment where I think the audience go, OK, it's that sort of play. I'm not going to tell you what it is, because that, that completely undermines the point. But um, you, you saw the play last night, didn't yes. you? So this, so, so, and so I think, in a way, maybe that's as, as close as I would get to sending a little something out there. Given that we've all now gathered as a kind of aperitif before seeing the show, is the, what's this situation then become? How do you now feel, having been told no research is necessary, but we still come to listen? Would anybody want to put a question? <laughs> Very good. Yes, please. Um, I wasn't going to answer that. Oh, no. okay. <laughs> I was going to ask if your play had changed much over the rehearsal um, It's sort of... It has in, we've made quite a few cuts, um, just little cuts, lines here and there, and there's um, a, a sort of one sort of storyline that we've changed slightly in that we, um, we just sort of wanted to make it a bit cleaner and, oh, actually messier. Hmm. Um, and um, so, there hasn't been any sort of massive rewrites, but the, I've been quite, I sort of was around at the beginning and then went away for some rehearsals and then came in at the end. And, and you know, I'm very much for, I'm not one of these writers who goes, well, that's the play. 
just get on with it. You know, I want to make it the best it can be. And um, and there's even been little things through these previews where we've gone, oh, actually, we don't need that because they, they've already got that moment or, you know, or there's a big laugh there. And so um, there's there's been a bit of work, but not, not massive. So, but we did do... We did a... Um, a reading and then we did a week's workshop before Christmas and I went away and did some rewrites then. Um, and there was quite a big change between the first and the second rewrite. So, um, but if you, if you buy a copy outside, it's not massively different. Yeah, it's pretty close. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, please. Uh, can I ask you a question about the set design? Yeah. I mean, um, it strikes me that it's a very old fashioned tent that we're seeing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it reminds me a bit of uh, the, the old-fashioned canvas tents that uh, we used to use in Merv when I was in the Scouts as a teenager, and that was a quite a long time ago. Um, but I wonder whether the, the, the design of the set is how you envisaged it when you were away on your camping trip in Wales, um, and how different is it to that, um, and how different is it to the experience of the people who are in the company? It's really, really similar to how it was in the in the camping trip. It's uh, it's re you know it's it's well it's it's the same sort of design because there were there were you know wooden floors and it's like a little house inside with a wood burner in the middle and a, and beds at the back and all this magical things which you can't see at the moment and um, so it's it's pretty much how it was and. Um, so it is quite an old-fashioned design. I mean, we've put our own sort of twist on it here, well, the designer has. Um, but, you know, in, the, in the, the stage directions, apart from there being, you know, that you need a burner and there's got a table, it was sort of up for the designer how he interpreted it. And there's a stage... When the, the, the first scene in the play is out here and then the next scene, the main characters go into the tent and... And I just wrote in the stage directions, well, we go into the tent and the walls are revealed by some trick. Um, <laughs> so I just left that up to the designer, really, to sort how, how he's going to do that. And, um, and he's come up with a beautiful way of, of, um, of how it all works, which you'll... Are you all seeing it tonight? Yeah. yeah. All right, some of you are majority. So we won't tell you what, how it, what, what the trick is, but it's a good trick. But it, the first, uh, really early on, they say it's all knotted together like an old scout tent. So you're exactly right. That's exactly what it is. And we went, me and the designer went looking for... It's fair to say that we don't f fully positively represent the people who are running this campsite. So obviously we don't want to associate them in any way with the campsite that Michael went on. But we went <laughs> online and we put in glamping, which is the colloquial, and we immediately found a website with tents that looked exactly like this. That's what we copied. And then Michael had sent a nervous email a few weeks later saying, we have to disassociate it from these people, because these, otherwise they'll think I'm slagging off their campsite. Yeah. So it, it is what they, it's very, very, very accurate to what and these and places there's look a, like. There's a, a sort of important thing that, um, that it sort of looks like a house in a way for past the story and I think that that sort of helps with some of the storytelling so yes um I just wanted to ask you a little bit more about your writing process with this play and, and um so you said it, you had sort of once you had a space and a uh, sense of character and then opposite position. I wondered how long it took you to you know what, what was the um process that you went through with your well I, I wrote it I wrote it quite quickly I um uh, was um, going on an, an exchange with the Royal Court. They sent me to Mexico for a month, and um, you could go there and you did a few workshops, but you were encouraged to write. And um, the previous writer uh, who'd been here before was a writer called Mike Bartlett, and he wrote a play while he was there. And um, I had this commission, and I'd, I wanted to do it, and I'd been walking around with the idea of three tents in a field and not much else, um, and sort of bits from my holiday and bits of things that I'd thought about. Um, but I sort of thought, well, he wrote a play while he was away, I'm going to try and write a play. And so I, I, I wrote it within a month, uh, the first draft while I was away, and, um, and then delivered it, and then sort of... I'd moved away slightly from the initial idea, and Angus encouraged me to go back to that, which I did on the second draft, which was quite a big rewrite. 
but still the sort of central story and the characters were still there. And um, it's the first time though I've, I've written a play where I haven't had it mapped out as much as I normally do. Normally I, I plan lots out and um, I sort of know where I'm going to get. I don't quite know what's going to happen in the second half, but I sort of have lots of events and then I sort of piece it all together. But this time I just sort of just threw things at the page really and um, some of it stuck and some of it didn't and um, yeah. Yes, please. I'd like to ask a question about the, um, the use of children in the, the play. When you were writing it, did you consider at all um, having them as a more <coughs> integral part of the play with the family and their, because obviously how you do it, you just hear the, yeah. in the background, apart from the opening scene and the closing scene, and we just wondered, um, after <coughs> seeing it on Friday, whether it would have enhanced it or not enhanced it. Had you thought about that? I just thought it'd be really tricky. And, and there was a point where, um, I wasn't going to have any children in it at all. Um, there's a Al Nakebourne play, Seasons Greetings, which is all set around Christmas, and um, you never see the children. And it's only, you sort of don't, it's so cleverly done. Um, and there was a point, well, the first scene is, is the, the main characters bringing their sleeping children um, to the campsite. It's quite late at night and the, the children have fallen asleep and I, I just wrote that and, um, and then I thought should I cut them but I just thought it was such a lovely image that I'd never really seen on stage before and I thought about trying to use them more but I didn't really, I've had children in, in quite a few of my plays and it's just quite tricky um, and I like the so idea. So why have we got children and an animal? <laughs> well, they're not in it much. Um, so, and I just quite like the idea that they were sort of, you know, unseen, even though the, they talked about a lot and the holiday is a lot about the children. We're here for the children and that they're really important. And, you know, one of the characters is a school teacher and, you know, has all the children playing games off stage and then is bossing about everyone else on stage. And um, so... I did think of not having them at all, but then I thought it'd be great to have them. And, and yeah, then the chicken I just is a bit cheap, but <laughs> why not? Yes, please. Uh, listening to you describe the play in the process, uh, I kept getting flashbacks of uh, Nuts in May and Mike Lee. And I just wonder if Canvas is Nuts in May brought up today. Um, I, I only saw Nuts in May actually recently, and because uh, um, I, a, a friend had a copy of it, and um, well, it's sort of, it is like a, a, you know, it is still camping, although it's it's much more now because this whole idea of glamping is quite now. But um, it's sort of funny, um, Nuts in May. It's it is referenced in the program, isn't it? Yeah, and it's sort of. You know, it's quite a televisual piece because you've got, you know, stuff inside the tents. And, but there is, you know, the similarities, all the, the public-private thing and about people being noisy and, and disturbing other people. And um, so I wasn't copying. I was thinking about potential political dimension. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's quite interesting. I, I can't quite remember what happens, but does it all... One of the characters... play guitar. Yeah, one of the characters goes to... A bit crazy, and yeah, I'll probably have to watch it again. And... <laughs> yes, I was wondering how you see, if you do see, the life of your play. Because you say it's set now, and we all walk in and we know where we are. And um, recently went to Here by Michael Frame, which you've rewritten a couple of times. Um, do you see a play as a work that's going to change? Are you going to reset it? politically, maybe in 10 years' time, or is it almost a period piece, although we're seeing it now? Um, I think it depends, really. I think, um, I don't know, you'd sort of have to look at it in, you know, if it was, if, if it was getting redone at the time and, and whether it felt like it needed updating or, um, you know, like Abigail's party's on in the West End at the moment, another monthly. And that is very much a period piece now. And, and um, But the in the sort of look of it, but the world and what's going on is still very contemporary. And, and I think the, the sort of relationships and what's going on here is, even though it's set now, 
I could imagine the situation still going on in the future. And um, well, there's stuff I want to say, but I don't want to ruin some of the things for people. But some of the situations in the play, which are related to the economy now, I think will still happen in the future and still be relevant. So. How did you find it here? Did you feel it was contemporary? I think they played, I saw it, they played it as contemporary, didn't they? They didn't play it as They did, yes. And uh, I didn't have any issue with seeing it. I tried to find the script, and the script, because he said it changed it. And the script I found seemed to be the script I saw anyway, so I would love to see the previous script. But even this time, the reviews were pretty similar, I think, to first time round. And I was just interest, interested by this idea of the two things. Does a play become? of its period, or does it want to grow elsewhere, or is it just not in time anywhere, as you're pointing out? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what his play was, but he still felt a need to change the dialogue, to make it be like more acceptable to, to the audience. I do sometimes sort of monitor myself and sort of look at things and, and about sort of brand names and things which are really current, um, and, and to sort of, even though I want to make it now, just to open it up slightly but then you can get really self-conscious and it becomes a, sometimes a bit of a non-time where everything can become a bit general and I, and I feel um, my work sort of benefits from being specific and especially with humour the more specific you are the sort of often the, the, the better the better it works. It is an absolutely brilliant conceit to have because nobody would choose to go on holiday with complete strangers and yet that's what you have with camping, because that personal life does just, kind of, you, through paper canvas, or well, through canvas walls, we hear at other people's lives. So it's absolutely riveting. Yeah, context. and also the, the, the thing of the children sort of play together, so the yeah. parents get thrown together because of their children, so yeah. there's no escape. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much to Michael and Angus, and uh, I look forward to the, you all seeing the play tonight. A huge round of applause, I think. <laughs>